Can you take a picture? No, you you finish and then I'll. No, you're good. I just was gonna when you start talking. I'm gonna... Oops. Then we're gonna. Then you you'll share it, and then. Yeah, on Zoom. Are they gonna? Or, or they'll just watch it from the camp. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, so we're we're a pretty small group. Can we keep it informal? <laughs> uh, What's that? Yeah. I, tell me of a time when there's been more things going on in agriculture. Can you tell me a time? Major things that are impacting agriculture. Yeah, right? There, there's many disruptions then. I mean, but I, I think we're, we're on one hand maybe right of times in agriculture u.s agriculture we have as much going on as we do now especially as i think about utah the beef markets i mean there's so much uncertainty right now that you know when i when i give a market outlook it's really hard to say well what well, this is what's coming down the road right it's it's really hard but i i'm gonna just talk about a few things um that that i've been watching um, what are, what are some things that you've been seeing that, right, that, that you're, that you're watching or some things that are keeping you up at night besides the drought? Netflix. Some great new documentaries on Netflix, right? That's, I, I'm with you there. <laughs> What's amazing, we're setting records on the retail price, and you look at the calf market, I mean, it's, it's down right now. There's nothing that indicates that that's coming around. Nothing. Well, on the pressure on that, also the third part of that is pressure from the grain market. Too, yep. Take a on yeah. Yep. Okay, so you, what was your, you said two. Well, was, were the Packers and then... Uh, Yeah, I, I share those same concerns. I, when, uh, as an economist, I, I look at the big pitch and I say, when consumers have money, they buy beef and lots of it. And consumers still have money, but what's happening to that money? It's shrinking really fast, right? It's been, a lot, it's been since the early 80s since we've seen inflation like this. And so I know just as of recently, right, you go to the grocery store, I mean, it, it's taken a little while, but now you go and you're like, wow, this is, this is this is changing the way I buy food because of that. What tell me what's keeping you up at night? Netflix, we know Netflix. I think just the roller coaster. The you know, a month ago cattle prices were pretty good. Yep. Things were looking good. Cost of feed been high for the cattle market. So you know, everything everything trickles down to the producer. The, the cost of feed. Feeders aren't going to pay what they. Yep. They're going to protect that margin, right? And who's going to pay the price for that? Feeders are in the middle. These packers are going to pay so much for their fats. Yep. They're only going to pay so much for feeders. And here we are, producers, and we're going to have to pay for it. Yep. And I know there's stuff being talked about with the packers, but how long is that going to take? I mean, before, 
if there is a major change, how long is that going to take? Yeah, I, I just don't know how that takes place. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where, where do we buy all our consumer goods? Walmart or Amazon, right? I mean, who, who, who dominates that market? Maybe Target's in there too, but Amazon, Walmart, maybe Target, right? There's three. Whole Foods, that's the only place I shop. I know Matt loves Whole Foods. I mean, that's, every day I catch him, he's like, oh, I'm going to go get my canoa salad and the, with, with tofu sprinkled on it. <laughs> But, but we as consumers are used to that type of market. Do you think consumers, because if we break that up, what does that mean? What are the, what are the big ones going to do? They'll price everybody else out, right? They'll, 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 they'll squeeze them out. And then consumers, we're used to relatively cheap food. And so I don't know. I don't know what consumers will do in that situation. That's a tough one on that on that Packer side. The only thing that might succeed, well, not affordable, but is what's going on with the chicken and Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. You're exactly right. So I, I'm just going to show some charts. Uh, please, anytime, interrupt me anytime. It's because I touched it. It's my fault. Okay, so this is, this is, I'm going to start with this and end with this. When I think of uh, financial implications of drought, right, because that's really what we're talking about from my standpoint. Anytime we talk about lot, lack of forage, increased feed costs, any of that, we're talking about some of these uh, financial implications. What, what do you view as your financial implications? Yeah. So liquidation means what then? Because what does that do to price? Right? It pushes price down, money lost for you. So that's that left hand side, that income statement, right? That you're going to have reduced revenue, higher cost probably. So that's going to really squeeze any profit margin you have is going to squeeze that out. Um, these tight cash flows, right? That those tight cash flows are going to reduce what I call financial flexibility, right? When you have some flexibility, you can absorb some of this, take advantage of opportunities. But I think the drought is, is eliminating any of that financial flexibility that producers had because it's squeezing out. Because what are producers doing with that equity, right? Balance sheet, we're looking at that equity. What are they having to do with that equity? Borrow against it, right? That safety net, we're borrowing against that safety net to keep us in business. And so when, when Matt or Eric and I, whenever we talk about these droughts, we're talking about multi-year implications. It's never just a single year. You know, I came from a potato background. Potatoes, we always took it one year at a time, right? Because you'd get through the year, oh, let's change our acreage. No, no major change had to take place. But in livestock, how do you make changes in livestock? It's very difficult to make major changes in one year. And so think about this from a multi-year perspective. Beginning of the year, we talked about the cost of input, so specifically fertilizer and fuels. So this is a, right, on the consumer side, they talk about consumer price index, what consumers are paying for, the, for goods. This is what we call our producer price index for farms. And you can see fertilizer, fuel, all of that, right? In addition to, right, we see that increased cost in chemicals. And that was, that was what our, was I pushing the wrong button? I don't know. <laughs> what, is this it right here? It doesn't like it. No, it does not. <laughs> it's just a little delay. 
But we're looking at, at 50, 75, 100% increase in these fuels, fertilizer. How many of you fertilized your, your grass this year? Your hay? Yeah, right? And that was the, that was the result. And the problem is, is now what's going to happen to your yield, right? It's a catch-22. And last, last year we fertilized everything. I fertilized ground that we would have never been able to ever fertilize because it was so dry. We got dirt from the top of the hay crop. So I don't know what we do. And I think this squeeze and feed this year is going to be, be tremendous because there's going to be so many people that had no choice but to fertilize less. And if there's less water, and I'll show you some charts related to that. One bright piece of news is we are not as bad as we were last year. When it comes to Western, this is the West as a whole. Maybe that Rich County, I think because Rich County was interesting. It was always in that loop that never was really classified as drought last year. But this year it is and been classified as that. But when we look at this as a whole, we started right around that 40% as classified as uh, percent poor to very poor. Last year, we started above 50%. But the, but the shape of that line, and I think Reagan's is going to show some really cool graphs that Eric, right, that, that get, bring that a little closer to home. But that shape of that line is going to determine a lot of how this summer goes. And I think we already can predict how the shape of that line is going to do, but it, it may surprise us. Interestingly enough, if you stretch this out, you know, typically, right, we see two to three years of that very poor to very poor, that spike, but then it, it comes back down. And so historically speaking, 2022 should have been that year that we see that rebound, but we might be one more year. Okay, so a year ago today, this is what our drought monitor, right? There's, we can see right, right where we're looking okay. Um, that was a year ago. If we go this, now this is May 10th, so just a couple of days ago, right? We're, most of the states in that moderate to severe category, a little bit of that extreme. But I want you to pay attention to this piece right here. What goes on in that piece of the United States? And cattle, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of cattle in that part of the United States. 2012, 2013, when we saw that drought, it was Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, right? It was, it was really focused in that area. So as we watched this drought, last year we were watching it and, and it subsided as the year went on, Texas got some moisture. And so the drought actually just shifted back to the West. But we wanna to watch to see if that keeps pushing East like it is, there's gonna be some major market impacts due to that. And, and not that the West isn't gonna to contribute to that, but when we see those impacts in Texas, Major, major impacts in the, in the markets. Uh, that one doesn't tell us anything. So December 1st hay stocks, this is 2021, December 1st. As that gets brighter red, you can see 43%, 40%, 20% reduction. You can see all of that, right? And that's just hay on, on hand in the West, right? This is our supply, what we're seeing in supply. Now, just recently, the May numbers were released, and we can see that percent change from 20, May 2021 to May 2022. So think about this as, as hay uh, stocks on hand. The U.S. is down 7%. Now, you can see Utah's up 71%, so makes me wonder about some of these numbers. But it could just be people hanging on. Last May was really bad, right? So you have to kind of look, last May was really bad. And so even just a slight increase from last May, but look at Washington, Oregon, uh, Nevada, Arizona, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, I mean, New Mexico, you can see Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, all those had major reductions in hay stocks. Yeah. Well, how do they, how do they make it? How do they catch it? Because there's huge, there's still, you out in the snow mill and Montana County and Cassidy, there's huge hay stacks. Yep. Already pre -bought by the tied up. So those are, from my understanding, those won't be count, right? Those, if they've been pre-sold, those are not considered to be stocks, right? Those are the, yep, yep. So even though we may see it in the barn or see it covered up, that's not counted in this.
That's still going to China. Huge. China, China will take as much alfalfa as we can send them. Right. Period. I work for cash commodities for the Fed. Like a year and a half or so. Yeah, it's. So, like all the trade stuff, and I know Portugal is having trouble and stuff for them. Yeah, so. Uh, there's a company in, in Logan that just, they, they've been in the meat industry. This year, they just started brokering hay and shipping it to, to Japan, South Korea, China. And so when I heard that they started, there must be a lot of money in that for them to jump into that. Yeah, so I think, uh, and right now there's that big battle. Do we export it, right? Or, or, do, we, or do we keep it? And there's there's going to be a there's going to be a bidding war. Um, so a student of mine that's down in Cedar City, he just called me last week and said a broker came onto their farm. They they have about two thousand acres, really nice alfalfa there in Cedar City, and he offered them three hundred thirty dollars, sight unseen, no test, no nothing, anything they could produce, he'd pay them three hundred thirty dollars. Yep. And and so they held off because because what do farmers do? What's going to happen to that price? It's going up. <laughs> so but I, I think it, right you look at california california's already past 400 dollars um right you think because that's what when i think about the hay market in utah i think who's who's competing idaho's trying to take right for the dairies they want to buy as much as possible california wants to buy as much as possible we want to export as much as possible and we also need to keep some back and so that's there's a lot of competing forces for that hay here and no right so when we have low supply, sometimes economics works, right? We have low supply, demand's high, that's going to drive that price up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Last summer, I had reporter after reporter would call and say, how much, how much of this hay is going to China? How much of our water is going to China? And that's really hard to, because you can look at how much hay sent and alfalfa sent to China, but they don't say what state it originates from. So it's just me kind of back of the envelope math trying to figure that out. And I was around 17, 20% of our of Utah hay that, that, that is exported out into to China. Yeah. But that's but that's me estimating, right? I don't I don't I I can't track that from point A to point B exactly. But but yeah, that's a major issue. That's a major issue. And, and when they talk about saving the Great Salt Lake, how do you save the Great Salt Lake? There's only one way. Huh? That's it, right? That's it. They keep talking. I'm like, there's only one discussion that we need to have. And that's the hard part. What, what do they say the benefit of saving? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. It's not like the lack of salt. Uh, Isn't that something to do with the wind coming off the? They say the chemicals and the, the yeah, the lake effect snow is hurting. The lack of lake effect snow would hurt the ski resorts, and we're being recorded, so I probably better just stop. But <laughs> I have a hard time believing that number. I mean, she showed on the slide before the last three Utah was negative. That was, that was December 1st. Yep. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm struggling to see where that's 71. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's, but you look at, how many of you read the Hoyt Hay Report? Do any of you read that? You've, I've been following, I, I get that on a weekly basis. That's about the only place I can find prices for Utah anymore is coming out of that because the USDA doesn't report it. But Every report says very little movement in Utah, no sales to be reported. And so it could have been a function of either they're all sold for, but sold for exports and no one wants to say what they're selling for. Or, I mean, this is based on phone calls and surveys. And so I, I think we're negative here, but I mean, look around, is there any excess hay? Yeah. Cash County, there's no excess hay. Box L, there's any box L or just? No, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I, I would take that number with a grain of salt. I, the other challenge is 
happen with the A market is we're upside down when we drive to the market. We're driving the market rather than the dairy and the high quality stuff because we have so it taken the price differential. It really doesn't matter whether it's crappy feeder hay or no. high quality dairy hay. It's the same price. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so that's when I think about impacts of drought for livestock, this is my number one, right? Is looking at feed costs. I think that's going to drive all your decisions this summer. Is it going to be these feed costs? Um, this is coming off, like I said, this is USDA and then taking some of that uh, Hoyt report, right? This is on all, all qualities, right? So this is poured to the best. We average, we're averaging right around $270 right now um as of the latest right uh california is about that 280 same oregon's almost 300 right now across all qualities so um we're going to see that continue in my opinion continue to rise as the year goes on i do not have the magic touch here <laughs> okay i'm just want to quick i'm going to quickly go through some of these I mean, so that blue line, just pay attention to that blue line. On each of these charts is 2022. That dotted line was 2021. Dark red is the past five-year average. Just notice a trend here. I'm, I, don't even, I don't think I even need to say anything on some of these. So that's pork, chicken, beef. So retail, right? This is all retail. We're seeing those record high prices on the beef side though. So this is coming out of USDA. Notice that, so this is a demand index. So this is what consumers are demanding for beef. A hundred would be average. You can see 2021, we're at 125, the highest demand for beef that's been recorded since 2000, since we started this. That demand was off, right? It was just, we hadn't seen that level of demand anytime in the, right? 2004, 114 was the, you know, and then 2020 at 119. So that demand, but this is 2021. And I really think as inflation starts to trickle in, we're going to see that demand soften quite a bit across, uh, across the beef markets. Exports, interesting enough, we saw Japan, right? import a bunch just there for a little bit at the beginning of the year, but we've seen that steady trend, steady strong demand coming out of our four major ones plus China, right? Those exports, not just domestically, but exports. Um, right, so, so that's just the total, we can see the total there. Um, when we look at this as a cycle, cattle is very interesting in is that we've seen these cycles and you can see 2014 to 2022, that cycle has periods of growth, levels off, and then decline. And you can see we had very slow growth, but now we're on that decline. We're seeing herds reduce, smaller calf crop. I don't think we've seen quite the, we haven't seen the numbers from lower calf crop from drought last year out of the West. But you can see we're coming down where inventory is gonna be reduced for a few years now following that cycle. Um, so this is change in feeder cattle. We started talking about, so change in, in feeder cattle supply outside feedlots. Um, you know, Texas down 80%. The U.S. as a whole is down. You can see is that Midwest is almost all down um, as we go across just that cross section of the United States. When we look at calf crop, um, oh, sorry, heifers held as replaced. We'll get the calf crop. Uh, 2022, that was down 3.3% for those heifers held as, as beef cow replacements. I'm sorry, my replacement guy. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and we really, I thought this year, right, 2022 was going to be a rebound year, both on moisture. And I mean, that's what data was showing. But, and it may turn around, but, but we're just seeing these, these herd sizes drop. So this is our change in total calf crop. Right, we can see that that west that change in the right Utah, uh, Montana had a bad one, Texas had a bad one, um, and so we're starting to see those reductions come down. And then this is uh, unfortunately USDA doesn't report any prices coming out of Salina, so I, I have to use the Billings uh, auction. 
But right, just like we were saying, there was some momentum in, in, in the cattle markets. And then just as of recently, we've lost some of that momentum. That's four to 500 pounds. Five to 600 pounds. We're still above that average, but we're nowhere near where we need to be to cover these feed costs on, on these prices. So one thing I'm curious about, there, and is that being in the cattle trucking business, I know kind of what happens there. All these California cattle that normally go grass, you know, they take them to grass in California's winter, they're coming back home straight to feed grass. Yeah. There's no grass here. Yep. So is that, I mean, yes, we're in it. Is there a chance that that's going to rebound a little bit once we get through a bunch of those? It's four or five hundred weight calves. If you got them selling at the auction, and you're competing with all the cattle being trucked in right now. How long will it take to rebound, though? That's the question. <laughs> Matt, do you have a sense on that? Or? I mean, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, this is this is kind of unique times for, for a lot of things. So I mean, it it could be quick. It could be like was it 2014 where it, it takes us a while. Well, know that there's several probably hundred thousand heads normally would go to grass for going straight to feeder. Well, I think also the how quick it, it bounces back depends on what happens this summer. If if our if our condition conditions deteriorate so rapidly that we start lick. Texas starts liquidating, right? Then this is going to take a few years. And then the other problem is we're having right now, those cattle hitting the feedlot, are they being maintained and then finally coming back? That's a different story than they're hitting the feedlot and they're being finished. Right. If, you, if you throw that factor in there with our capacity issue right now, then that creates a whole other issue as well. Well, the third component of that is in the feedlot, can they eat through processing? Yeah. I don't know how they can. You look at DDGs, you look at any, any, any type of feed, it's sky high right now. So um, corn prices, right? We see corn prices keep going, um, right? Driving, and I just use that for, for feed prices. Um, interesting enough on corn, right? We talk about corn, um, ending stocks is really a key driver of corn price. So you can see 2012 when we had that drought, we're almost at the exact same inventory level that we were in 2012 as we are now. Um, if you see the progress planning report, that Midwest, the upper Midwest has just been hammered with snow and rain, right? And so they're at 3%, 4% planted, and they're traditionally at 60 to 70%. And so uh, I think corn is still gonna be, corn, corn because of these low supplies and high demand, is going to be sky high this year. Interesting enough, too, with wheat prices, wheat prices are as high as they've ever been, ever. And so a lot of farmers have switched to wheat, right? When they never switch it, but they're taking advantage of it. And so, once again, just limiting that supply of corn, driving up that feed cost. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I, a good friend of mine, the, he, he's a banker in Twin Falls, said a lot of his growers are saying, why would I put potatoes in this year? cost of fertilizer. I don't know how much water I'm going to get. If I run out of water with potatoes, I'm done. Wheat, I could get something out of it. So yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so when we come back to this, I think one of the big things to think about this year is, especially for a producer, is the cost of gain. How do you measure your cost of gain? What size of calf do you sell? What does it cost you to get that five and a half? <laughs> but you're going to have to weigh, right? Do we feed it? Do we liquidate it? Understanding if, if I feed it for another, if I have to feed it, right? If I have to buy feed for it versus take it off the mountain early, what happens to my cost of gain? What happens to my break even? Those are decisions you're going to have to wrestle through depending on what, what, what happens to your range. Um, did you have to come off early last year? What's this year looking like? It's good right so everything's looking okay? I think as a whole, well, Sarah, oh, there it is. I think as a whole, our, this valley looks better this year than it did last year. And even last year, as we drove around the state, I mean, Rich County to me was 
Oh, yeah. It, it was the best looking county. We drive through, we're like, man, we're just... yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, but there's these key time periods, but, you know, my key takeaway is we think about some of these financial implications, think about penciling out that cost of gain, because that's going to drive those decisions. That cost of gain is, is more than what you're going to, right? That cost benefit. It's, if it's going to cost you more to get them heavier, then what's good, you're going to get back in return, right? That's going to drive a lot of those decisions that you're making at the producer level, at the, right? So um, with that, uh, you can reach me anytime. Any other questions? I appreciate your feedback. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, you know, when I came back, I was in North Dakota, came back here. That's a, I can't remember who told me that you have to remember ranchers are, you're forage producers. We're, the, hey, we're, we're not cowboys. No, no, the cat, the, yeah, you're grass farmers, right? And, and you happen to graze those cattle on that grass. And so that's the output, but that grass is what drives, right? Tied to that land is what drives everything else. Well, that's what this Kevin Jensen. So he's the he's the forage and research lab. He uh, he was just telling me he says the hard part is is as bad as dry as it was last year. That grass needs one to two years of rest to recover. He says even if we had a perfect winter, perfect spring, that grass needs another year of recovery. He says if we go on and graze it hard this year, as weak as it is, it's going to change it permanently. He says that's the hard part. But he says. Ranchers, right? And, and rightfully so, right? I, who am I to, but you're going to say, I got to get as many on there as possible. But that's going to, that's going to have some dramatic impacts on that grass. Yes. Yep. You know, and Eric Thacker, I wish she was here, but we always talk about this conservative stocking. We, we, we argue you always should be conservative. Even if you leave extra grass, that's okay. But be conservative year in and year out. But those are Thacker. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Those are that's why I'm preaching. I'm preaching with a choir. But those are hard, those are hard, those are hard decisions. Those are really hard decisions. But yeah, I think I think that's spot on. So yes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. We're going to try we're going to try to be smarter than Larson here. Stand on the other side so this thing works. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I got my thumb drive for me, too. I'm going to try this. Oops. Do I have it? Thank <laughs> you. 
Boom, works. All right. So I'm glad Dr. Larson came in and kind of gave us the bad news right up front. Now I'm going to give you the probably it's too late news because with our animals, you know, especially cattle, everything's slow moving. You know, our generation interval slow, changing our, the type of animals we have is slow. You know, everything operates very slowly. Now, that being said, you know, we should always be looking at our, our operation as a whole, looking how, you know, one decision at one time point is going to affect us down the road. Now we have to think about this drought impact, you know, all these external factors of markets and, you know, inflation and everything else now. So this, this, this presentation is, it's one of those things that if you're already in it, it's probably a little bit too late. So we're just, we're just going to talk about nutritional needs of cattle and how, you know, those change over time and what we can really manage during, during drought. Now we have to understand a cow's nutritional components are going to, their needs are going to change over their lifetime. You know, think of a heifer versus that mature cow. You know, those are very different needs. That heifer is still trying to grow, but we're also incorporating it in our production system, right? So we're asking her to grow, breed, calve, repair her uterus, breed again. But now we throw drought on top of that. So now we've decreased her forage plane. So we really have to understand that this is, this is going to be a, another one of those challenges because typically in a normal year, our cattle have access to a pretty wide diversity of forages. You know, that diversity during drought, especially during like what Dr. Larson was talking about with Dr. Thacker, those compounding effects, that diversity starts decreasing as well as, you know, that, that volume decreases as well. So now there's, there's less overall forage, but now there's also less diversity to choose from. So they're eating a lot of times the things that they might not have selected for in a normal year. Oops. Thought I was going to do better than, than Larson. <laughs> Guess not. Well, I, I'm still going to do better with the, with the clicker at least. So in terms of nutritional quality, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about last year and we're, as we went around the state, a lot of people were saying, you know, in terms of green up and some of the things we talk about, you know, even the cheatgrass didn't green up last year. So in terms of quality, you know, that nutritional quality is going to affect everything in our production system. You know, the higher the quality, obviously, you know, the better for the cow, better nutrition status, you know, the harder we can push them from a production standpoint, they're going to affect everything from growth, milk production, reproductive efficiency. And I say reproductive efficiency because do we have a fertility problem in cattle? We don't have a fertility problem. Heifers are still getting bred at the same rate that they were in the 1970s. We have a reproductive efficiency problem. We want those cows to breed every single year, right? So that's our problem. They'll breed as heifers, right? But what happens after that, that first breeding? When do we lose most of our cows? That three, four, four-year-old egg. Because not only do they have that production requirement they're putting on for that calf, but we're also asking them to still grow. So a lot of these animals, depending on breed, will also have a growth component until they're almost five years old. So that's something we tend to kind of look neglect. Now, nutritional quality will also affect longevity. Now, when we think about longevity in, in cattle, what affects longevity? Pretty much everything. Injury, open, you know, temperament in some cases. You know, lots of different things will affect that. Nutritional quality will also affect our final product. Now, part of the problem, like I said, with our industry is everything is slow moving. So to really find kind of these effects a lot of times, it, it's a long time. How long does it take us to get to that final product after we calve until that calf hits the table? 18 months. So you're, you're thinking born, wean, feed a lot, finished, packed. You know, so that decision, that, that final carcass quality, we don't really find that fine, what our hard decisions affected that for a long time. So I, what I'm saying is we should always be kind of thinking of, you know, that production system, but also we're, we're going into, into breeding right now. We should have been planning for that back in calving so that we're not getting into, into calving and going, oh, well, I need this or, or into breeding and I need this. And, you know, so I need to change this in my herd this year. These are things we should be evaluating throughout the, the entire year. 
Now with drought, like I said, nutritional quality is also affected, but nutritional quality is also affected by the plant part of the plant, the age of that plant, you know, season, weather, drought, obviously, soil quality, and then our stocking rates. Like we're talking about, especially these last couple of years, especially in, in parts of the state where we've had multiple years of drought, those stocking rates, a lot of times, we've kind of kept them pretty similar. And after we've done that a couple of times, grazing real hard and taking more plant mass off than we should have, that's probably going to affect us for multiple years down the road. It's not going to be, you know, we've gotten a lot of rain. Well, not a lot. We've gotten some rain on the other side of the mountain. And there's some green up right now. A lot of people are saying, oh, we're good. We can go out. But we're still in that recovery phase of a lot of this. So not only are, as we'll see, in the plant recovery, but a lot of our animals are also in plant recovery. Our animals are also in recovery. So how many of y'all would say, in terms of body condition on your cattle here in Rich County, are a little bit less than they were maybe last year, even the year before, even feeding? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're essentially trying to supplement our way out of, out of drought, right? We've, take, we've lost that forage on range, so now we're having to incur some of these costs trying to keep those animals in the production system. Oh, okay. So the thing to remember, especially with cows, you know, we're, we're kind of in a cyclic system. Those cows all have a maintenance requirement. You know, their base is maintenance to keep themselves alive, keep those physiological processes going. The thing we have to remember is if we're not meeting that maintenance requirement, reproduction is a luxury. An animal is not going to reproduce if she does not have the ability to meet her own needs. So in a drought situation, we've taken that forage off. And we've, we calved her out this year. She still has that maintenance requirement, but she also has a lactation requirement now. The highest energy demand we can put on an animal is lactation. So when she's milking, that's when she should have, you know, the most available forage in front of her, because that's when we're going to see her start willing down, start losing that, losing that body condition score. But we're also asking her to repair that uterus. So, you know, anyone who's seen calving or childbirth, there's, there's some, some physiological injury there. You know, in cows, when are we asking them to rebreed? It's 45 to 90 days. So I don't know. I don't know anyone that would want to have a kid 45 to 90 days or get pregnant again after having a, a child. So, but that's what we expect our cows to do, right? We're asking them calf, repair, lactate, have this high energy demand, raise this calf, but we want you to rebreed again or your longevity in this herd is gonna go away. We're gonna sell you. So once we get that, we're asking her not only rebreed, but we want you to maintain this pregnancy while you're still recovering from, the pregnant, from, from your, your previous pregnancy. We want you to not lose too much body condition score because you're still lactating for that calf. So you can see here how drought and decreased forest can really throw another wrench into this. We've decreased the amount of forage that this cow has in front of her, but we're still expecting her to perform at the same energy level, right? All right, so this is actually just a, a chart that I, I always find kind of interesting, and it just kind of shows how that cow's nutrient demands are going to change over time and with the production system. So calving, you know, she's going to, you can see her dry matter intake and everything is going to be pretty high. But look, what, look at this right here in terms of breeding. This is when we're asking her to, to prove herself and remain in our herd. Her nutrient demands of breeding are probably the highest that they are in the entire stage of production. Why is that? She just calved. She's trying to allocate resources to protect the uterus or for repair the uterus. She's got a calf on her, so she's lactating, and she's still gotta maintain herself. So you can see how a lot of times we'll, we'll sit there and we'll, we'll say that it's the cow's problem. And we'll talk a little bit about, if you've ever seen me talk before, we talk a lot about genetic selection and matching those genetics with our forage resources. So if we have a cow that doesn't really match our forage resources and her energy demands are too high in a, in a, in a year like this in drought, what's typically going to happen to her at the 45 days of that breeding period? She's going to miss it. She's not going to breed. She's going to allocate resources to taking care of herself so she doesn't whittle down even further. 
Now, this is kind of my, my too late slide. So the other thing we know that is that as we increase the size of those cows, we increase the energy demand and the nutrient demands on those cows. So if you're going into drought with a 1,400 pound cow, you're stuck going into drought with a 1,400 pound cow. You're, you're not changing that right away, right? Even if you got replacement animals. So I mean, th think about that heifer side of things. Not only if well, on the cow side, now we've decreased the forage resources in front of her. We're still asking that heifer, that first calf heifer, to do all the same things as that cow, right? So in terms of size, you know, we, we're, if we're going into drought big, we're, we're stuck going big. But you can see here, you know, just months to calving, you can see this dry matter intake needs to be going up. She's going to be taking in more, trying to eat more. She's getting ready for that, that calving interval that, and getting ready to lactate. But you, also, you can also see here the difference between the 1,000-pound cow up here and that 1,400-pound cow. So dry matter intake one month prior to calving is about six pounds higher than that 1,400-pound cow. Is that the size of that calf, that 1,400-pound cow, going to offset? Probably not. Well, is that 1,400-pound cow, if we went through drought last year, is she more than likely still around? She might be, but is she going to rebreed this year, you think? Maybe. Depends on how much hay you fed her. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit as well, because that, that's another factor that we, we typically talk about in, in terms of getting through this. We typically try to feed our way through it. So, all right, so this is just another one, cow and heifer. So if we look at, at, at our lactating cows, you can see once again, as we increase, you know, the size of the cow, months after calving. You can see here, months after calving, the, the time period that we're trying to get her to rebreed again, her energy demands are going up. But if you look at the, the lactating two-year-old heifers, as we increase size, even on those heifers, those nutrient demands are gonna go up on those heifers. You know, they're going up as they, they kind of get a little bit away from, from calving. So once again, these ones here, these heifers still have a growth component as well. So they're more complex. That's why we tend to lose a lot of these heifers, these second, first calf heifers, second calf heifers, because they're always kind of operating in that, that negative balance a lot of times. They're always playing catch up. They're trying to grow. They're trying to replace that, repair that uterus. They're trying to lactate. But yet we're still trying to, you know, after they have that first calf, what do we typically do with them? Where do they go? Are they not, they're a heifer anymore? They're part of the cow herd now, right? So if, they're, if they, they're not separate, they're out there hustling against the cows, they're trying to grow, trying to raise the calf. They got a, quite a few more challenges. And if we make them really big, they have even more challenges. So once again, this is kind of the too late slide. So if you're in drought and you've already got these size cows, you're, you're operating in, in this year with those size cows. Now, the other thing we tend to neglect is water. So can you live longer without water or food? Food. You'll die a lot sooner if you don't have water. And this, the reason I put this slide up here is, you know, especially down on the Strip, Arizona Strip, we saw a lot of producers that didn't even go out last year just because dry stock tanks weren't even, didn't have enough water. Financially, it didn't make sense to haul water. So there, this was a problem. But even if you increase size of the cow, you know, she's going she's gonna to need more water. As we increase milk production, our heavier milking cows not only have that, that higher energy demand, but they're also going to need more water. You know, they're, they're dumping a lot of that water into milk. A lot of that's being allocated there. So, you know, once again, as we increase size, as we increase milk, you know, those are things that we, we really need to, that are really going to influence forage intake as well as water intake. Now, we always say that this is, this is slide probably is one of the ones that I got in most trouble for putting up. And we, we typically say you want to try to match your production system with your forage production. And that makes sense, right? But is it really feasible a lot of times when someone's telling you, hey, this is when you can go out? Or, hey, this is when you need to be off. Is it really feasible a lot of times to kind of match that production system exactly with, with your forage production? Sometimes, maybe. So 
if you're if you in a drought year, how would you match your production system with your forage production? <laughs> I like those examples. So I have I, I have low herd cows and I summer feed them and they go to South and they take in another guy's cows, we put them together, feed them, then they come to my place. And thinking I pulled my cows out early, brought them back to the some fall feed, it was dry, it was terrible feed, but I supplemented them and kept them going. The other gentleman kept his cows there. Going to get every stem of grass and carrot and kept them up there until the smoke fly thinking it was really cut in the corner. Right. And keep them, hold them cows as long as you could for them to win a race. <laughs> cow teeth to be thin. I fed the hell out of them all winter because then they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. My cow, I fed them less and they maintained that. Yeah. And that, and you know, that that's one of those things we talk about too is in terms of acclimation. You know, and we'll, we'll see some of that here in a second in terms of trying to feed your way out of this. You know, sometimes it just doesn't work and there's a reason for it, you know, and, you know, in terms of, of managing this, you know, we're really trying to, we would like to be able to match our stage of production of that animal with our forest supply. So that would kind of be like matching that the cow's going to calve. If we're going to have optimal green up, optimal forage quality, optimal forage quantity. A lot of times that just doesn't work just because of where we're at, but no, you're right. Sometimes you can't. I mean, even though, like, Well, we don't want to start feeding right. To, but in the long run, if you don't start at the right time, it's going to bite your own Well, that's that's part of the problem too. So if you calve and there's not a bunch of grass up yet, but you had that that was your time you had to calve. You know, if you're not managing those cows until that grass comes up, the the next long term effect is that next that next breeding season, your next calving season, everything else is affected as well. So your your decision in January February. Is going to affect you that next year detrimentally. All right. So one thing we, we talk a lot about is, is terms of an indicator of productivity is looking at body condition scores of cows. You know, if if basically body condition score is just an indicator of, of that fleshing or that fatness, fat reserves on that cow. You can see some of these aren't like I, I've seen some that look like two that are way worse than that. But so basically it's a one to nine scale, you know. One, two, extremely skinny, eight, nine, extremely fat. Now, the general rule is we don't want to be on either side of that scale because the first thing is, what's the first thing to sacrifice by being too fat or too skinny? Reproduction. So we can't get too fat. We can feed them too much. So we want to kind of be right there in the middle, but we don't want to be too thin so that these animals are allocating reserves to maintenance rather than reproduction or maintaining a pregnancy. So in terms of a low body condition score, there, there's a couple things. And me and Thacker kind of go back and forth on this. And it's, it's probably a combination of both. I admit it. But so if you have low body condition scores and you have a whole bunch of cows coming in that are low body condition score, that typically means that your range resources or your supplementation program are not meeting the needs of those cows. If everyone's coming in thin, they're all facing the same issue. Now, if you have a few coming in, stragglers coming in that are low body condition scores and everyone else looks okay, that could mean either you got some sickness or those cattle aren't, aren't compatible genetically or production-wise with, with your forage resources. They might have nutrient demands that are too high. You know, we, we tend to see this in, in, for heifers, example. The big, beautiful heifer. You know, the one that we all think we want to keep and we, we think she's the best. And she breeds that first year. She looks gorgeous. And what happens to her when she comes back during a rough year? She's open. She's, she doesn't look as pretty, does she? <laughs> but see, that, that's typically what happens. She, she might not have either we didn't manage her correctly or maybe her nutrient demands were too high for our forage resources. You know, maybe she just needed more groceries to really stay in that system. It's the equivalent of, of taking a, a cow from central Missouri and throwing her out here. Productivity is going to be sacrificed. You know, there's just not enough groceries out here for her to maintain herself that high level. Doesn't mean she's a bad cow. She's just a bad cow for here. On the other side, if we took some of our cows here and threw them in central Missouri, they'd probably say they're too small. You know, they, they just don't have enough for us. So 
you know, it's, it's just a, it, it's, it's really trying to be compatible with everything. Ooh. All right. So one of the things that we, we noticed that if, if we come in thin and we're not really monitoring that body condition score, you know, that lower the score we get a lot of times, that's typically going to also affect our pregnancy rate. You know, lower body condition score, once again, she's allocating resources towards maintenance and keeping herself alive. Reproduction is a luxury. In terms of calving interval, we're going to see that calving interval stretch out. She's not going to be on that yearly interval. It's going to take her a lot longer to take to breed. So she's going to be in there. You know, when we wean that calf, if she does have a calf, you know, that calf is going to be much younger compared to her contemporaries because it took her a longer, lot longer to breed. It's going to take her a lot longer to actually get that calf. You know, that calf's gain is going to be lower. We can assume that weaning weight is going to be lower as well. You know, that income for that calf is going to be decreased as well. Smaller calf, probably less productive calf, younger calf. And in terms of yearly income on that cow, these are just examples, you right? So this is, this is an older study, but what I'm trying to drive home here is if we don't really monitor that body condition score, you can see here as we get towards these lower, are you profitable with a 43 or 61% conception rate? So if you have a 43 or 61% conception rate, what's your percent wean calf crop? Are all those calves gonna make it to weaning? So that you got to figure you're also selling probably closer to 38 and 55% wean calf crop. So that's not profitable. Now here at five or six, which is probably a little bit more optimal type body condition score, you can see here calving interval. We're trying to stay on that, that one year. Calf wean to age about the same way. You know, we can see right here that, you know, we're, we're doing a little bit better. You know, those cows are breeding more. They're weaning more calves. We probably have more calves breeding back as well, or more cows breeding back as well. Now, the one thing <coughs> that a lot of people want to do when they start seeing thin cows is correct that. Now, when do we typically want to correct? What, what's the time point we usually say, oh, our cows are too thin? <laughs> or when they're already too thin? We're going into breeding and we're going, what's that? Yeah. And then what are you going to do after you bring them home? <laughs> so how many, how much time do you have between bringing them home and breeding? Five months. Mm -hmm. So you got some time. So you got a you got a, a time to gradually increase that body condition score. If, if, if you if, if yeah. It's a problem, right. So I mean, but that I, I'm glad you brought that up because typically, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, that brings up the next question. How much, how, how much could you change that body condition score in that time period, do you think? Could you, could you, make, could you add a body, one or one and a half body? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it kind of goes back to what Dr. Larson was saying too. Is it more economically viable for you to take that calf off and wean him early so that that cow remains productive rather than selling, you know, a calf that might weigh 75 pounds more? So, and this, this is kind of what, yes. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't mind a conditional at home. Like I had a hurt calf we would bought a condition for each other so it was more objective. Right. And if there was a slight change at all that in two weeks, we would make an adjustment. Yeah. And the, I think what it taught me is every now when I have my own cows, but every time I eat, I'm looking at body condition. Yes. Every time it's in my mind. 
And I'm glad you said that because body condition scoring shouldn't be done before breeding or after calving. It should be done throughout the entire year. And, that, and the reason for that is, is you start seeing that drop, it's a lot easier to correct a minor change than to come in and say, oh, my cows are all threes. I need to get them to five by breeding. Because not only there, there's some problems associated with doing that quickly. So we can see here, if we're lower than the bo body, five body condition score and we want to increase that, you know, we're looking at a, an average a 1.8 pound per day increase on those cows, get them to change that body condition score. You know, if we're, if we're looking at, you know, over here, if we, if we only increase it a little bit, you know, you can see here, we're really not increasing that pregnancy rate a lot, but what, what, are, we, what are we increasing by feeding those animals? Your costs. Well, look at that. So, I mean, you can see here that, you know, the quick changes probably isn't the best idea because if you, if you change that body can score quickly, what's going to happen when that cow goes out to a, a normal production system? She's going to drop quick too. So basically you invested a whole bunch of money to change it real fast. But then when she goes out on her own, has to make a living on her own, she's going to drop as well. All right. So I just found this interesting. I saw someone talking about this a couple of months back. And it increased one body condition score on average. A cow needs to gain about 75 pounds. So if we have cows coming in and a body condition score of three and we want to get them to a five, that cow needs to gain about 150 pounds. Now, in a six month period, is that, is that feasible? Probably. In a 90 day period, is that feasible? I mean, I bet you could do it, but at what cost? So your lactating cow needs 575 pounds of total digestible nutrients to do this. Your lactating cow needs about 10 pounds a day of corn for 75 days to increase one body condition score. Anyone price corn? So let's say that's, that's what, a, just at the feed store, that's like a bag and a half. So when I was there the other day getting some stuff, a 50 pound bag of corn was $13.80. So I need, how many, how many bags do I need for that one cow? Is it worth feeding her that to increase that one body condition score? Probably not. So that's, that's one thing we also need to account for. And you know, I always kind of hate throwing Dr. Larson a bone here, but with every production system we have, or decision we have, there's also an economic ramification to that. So yeah, we might increase that body condition score. She might breed. Is that calf going to offset the, the cost of everything we put into that cow to get her to do it? That's something we need to take into account. Well, more than likely you're going to do it again next year if you keep them. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I don't say that because people get kind of mad when you tell them they should sell their cows. But <laughs> I, I just say, you know, you're going to do it again next year. And with feed costs, it's more expensive this year to do it than it was last year. And it's probably going to be more expensive again. So, you know, that's something to consider. Well, her break even, her break even goes from being five or six year old to nine, 10, maybe even longer. Because more than likely, she's never going to pay for herself. Calculations. Oh, yeah. If you take out one or two of those calves, that, that break even goes from five years to nine years. I mean, so think about feeding that for nine years before you're breaking even. Well, I, I was taught that if you look at the lifespan of the cow, her value, as a, not as a heifer or a feeder, but her value as a coal animal goes up until she's about three years old. And after that, it, it drops mm -hmm. apart the other way. So if you've got non producing cows that are young or cows that are or, you know, I don't really like this cow or whatever. Get rid of them when they're young because you're, getting, you're just, yeah. gonna, you're just they're going to cost you the barrel. Right? Well, that's kind of like their, their weed out process as well, because that's really going to tell you how resilient she is in your system. Because that's when she's, she's at her highest, most vulnerable. And if she can make it through that without you having to baby her through it, more than likely she's going to be all right. But if you baby her through that yeah, as an adult like, cow, you're probably going to see it again. Right. So, I mean, you're, she's, more than likely, you're going to see that again at some point. 
So yeah, you're right. At some point, it, that tough decision needs to be made. But also, once again, that evaluation should be a regular process, like you were saying. We shouldn't go out, well, we just calve. Let's check body conditions. Oh, hey, we're getting ready to breed in, in 20 days. Let's check body. It's too late at that point. You know, this, is, this should be something we're evaluating throughout the entire year. You know, those quick fixes, they're, they're going to lead to quick problems the other way as well. You know, if it's a quick fix this year, it's going to be a quick fix next year. I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There's lots of times. No, I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's a hard answer because like you said, your young ones, in theory, you put a lot of into them. And in theory, those are your, that's your best genetics. Those are your herd changers. But that on the other side, they have to integrate into the herd to integrate those genetics. Now your old cows, you know, th that's kind of a, a double-edged sword as well because, you know, they're, they're in theory not as good as the young cows because genetically they've been passed. But if they're an old cow in your system that's still producing, that means she's also acclimated and compatible with your resources. So, yeah, it's, it's I, and I never suggest which ones you should sell. <laughs> I mean, the young ones, if they're not producing, I say get rid of them. Yeah. But, I mean, if they, if they integrate in, you know, I think at that point, you're starting to look at those, those older cows at the upper end that are losing teeth. And my, the one, my general rule is if I think she might not make it to that next, through that next winter, I sell her. <laughs> well, well, see, I've, I've given those ones the other chance, and then I end up bottle raising babies. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you, you're the you're the parent of her child that next year. So, <laughs> oh, You must have more money in the bank than me. Yeah, no, that's a valid point. But they're also calving out on 100,000 acres. Nobody's watching them. Nobody's paying attention to them. Right. They're not going to take a chance on them. Yeah. And you might try to write answers, whatever fits your operations. And I mean, if, and, and that's the thing, too. You got to look at those heifers that you're incorporating. What percentage of them are actually in there after their second calf? Because at that point, if I got a whole, whole slew of them in there as four year olds, I'm really looking at those old cows now because these ones in my mind, they've kind of hit that growth curve. That growth curve is almost gone. And now they're, they're just cows in my system and they've shown they can do it with a growth curve. So I'm starting to look at those old ones at this point. Now, if I had an 11 year old cow that sold me a $70,000 bull the year before, I am giving her another chance. So <laughs> she, she might die that next year, but she's paid her bills. And I, th there's a chance she might give me another $70,000 calf. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess if you're selling seventy thousand dollar bulls, I guess you can do that. I guess your normal producer. Yeah. I mean, you got you got the money to do it. You might as well try it. And maybe maybe they're onto something. But I mean, I have a real hard time selling that productive old cow that is still healthy. If she's healthy, I'm gonna give her a chance. If she's if she's looking rough, I'm probably sending her down. So. Me, a cow, once you see that first calf come back, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think mean, that's not even age wise, but it seems like once they draw that lean weight from there on out. Yep. And then, and then looking at those old cows too, just looking at that udder suspension, making sure she can actually raise that calf. So once those udders go back, I get I get rid of them. I don't care if she's eight, nine, ten, sold it at a great calf that previous year because calf can't nurse, not generate a product for you, even if she has it. So all right. So I think we actually covered this last, <laughs> last slide, but so once again, you know, like I said, you know, drought is just another piece of our puzzle. We should be evaluating everything in the previous. So if we're looking at calving, we should be, you know, looking at a breeding prior. We shouldn't be looking at breeding during breeding season, calving during calving season. We should be looking at it during that previous production cycle. So we're prepared. We can make the changes if we need to. And like I said, everything operates very slowly in beef production. So our decision we make today is a decision we're gonna be seeing the effects of in January, most, most likely, or even next year. So. I think slow process, which is gonna take a lot of the problems with the body conditions for the fishery to manage. I agree. With, you know, because there's enough, there's enough data and EPDs with feed efficiency and, and late game that it can be fixed through that. See, that does my heart good because no one ever talks about genetics in these things. And I'm. But it takes, it takes, it's a process. It is a process. And it, sometimes it's a long process and it's a looking at the whole picture process a lot of time. And it takes discipline. So it's like what I was saying earlier about taking another shot. You take mm -hmm. a counter right now, and if they drop down to a body condition five instead of six, that's the time you pull out a bunch of them before producers. Yep. Even though they look like big cows. Yeah. They don't they don't fit your deal. That that and that you know what? Mine's are tough and man, I hate to sell them and I'm gonna replace them and you know what am I gonna do? But in the long run, you're better off. Yeah, what's the economic Im impact of keeping those cows that might not be productive for you? But that you know, we all well kind of a little thinner the question I couldn't find it. That's when find Yeah. And that's that, the time I hit in the herd. And that's that's one of the things with my with the old cow thing still, because they more than likely have seen those those drought times before. They made them through them then and they're still productive. So I'm a little bit more, I guess, lenient on them if they're, if they're still healthy and producing. Are there any other questions? Oops, maybe. Someone sent me this. So, so I took this picture when I, I used to be at LSU when I started there. This was, no, when I started, they told me they were in a drought. <laughs> and I remember it rained every day for an hour at three o'clock. And they were complaining how dry it was. And I was just like, oh, I'm from New Mexico. So I was like, no, this is, we're flooding. So are there any questions? All right. Thank you. You win it, Larson? Man, they're going to win the championship without you. Oh, yeah. Forgot you had it. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay, so Dr. Thacker was supposed to be here and he's not. So I got the great opportunity to give his presentation. So I'm really glad that Taylor showed up because hopefully if you guys have any intense range, range questions, he can help me answer them. So this is the title of his slide is managing grazing during and after drought, but Dr. Thacker said this presentation is mostly talking about after drought because he feels that managing our pastures after the drought is actually most crucial to recovery of our ranges. So I pulled these graphs from, what is it, range? What was it? 
Rap. Yeah. That's the program, what it's called is RAP. Do you know what a range analysis platform? And any of you can get on this um, application and pull up the range that you utilize. You outline the range and it pulls up this data. So all this data is pulled from satellites. Just keep that in mind that there might be some variation. So what these graphs are showing is production of forage on our ranges. So I just took one of the allotments out west and it pulled up this data. So here in 2022, this black line is our forage production. And what these lines are up here, so this red dotted line is 50% of the um, long-term average. This yellow line is 75%. This line here is 100% the long-term average. So basically what this graph is showing is that our forage production for this year for our pastures is about 50% the long-term average. I now know why Dr. Thacker didn't come because these graphs are really depressing. And so I get to, I get to show them now. When we compare them to other years, we can look at 2021 and the forage production was sitting around 75% of the long-term average. When we look at 2019, who here remembers 2019, what it was like? Yeah, it was a very exceptional year. Um, we were above average in 2019 for our forage production. So basically the takeaway from this with this 2022 graph is what this line is projecting. I mean, if something happens, if we get more precipitation, if things start to warm up, this might change, but as of right now, we're sitting about 50% forage production. This shows um, more forage production, just overall forage production. So you can see the differences between 2022, 2021, and 2019, and just the difference. So in 2022, again, we're kind of sitting at projecting to be 50% of forage production. And in 2021, again, we were about 75%. And then 2019, we are above average at about 125%. So that's what these graphs are showing, um, what's being projected. So with that in mind, just know that we're below average for our ranges. We're below average on production. This graph is showing um, long-term average. So you can see if this is like 1980 something to 2022. What this graph is showing is there's always been a lot of variability in our forage production. There's lots of ups and downs. Um, because of this drought, this two-year drought that we're seeing, we're definitely seeing a decrease in production from average. Um, that's what this graph is showing. Lots of vari variability, but we're definitely seeing a decrease. Um, all this data was taken from this website. So you go to rangelands.app and you can pull up this production explorer. Like I said, you can go to any type of range, any of your pastures, private or public, and the satellite imagery will give you all of this data. So if you feel like this is something that you'd like to look into, I can definitely help you navigate that. So the biggest thing, he like really took up the the screen with his slides. <laughs> okay, the biggest thing Dr. Thacker wanted to talk about is just grass recovery with grazing. How we can utilize grazing in a way to help our range recover after a drought. This slide here is talking about grass roots. So I've always been told that the roots, whatever is above ground is what represents what's underground. So if we have a lot of cover above ground, we're gonna have a strong root system below ground. And what happens after the end of each year, we definitely see a decreasing root system and it's usually 30% of the roots that's decreased every year. That can be increased when we see drought or overgrazing. So when we decrease the biomass on the top level, we'll definitely see a decrease in our root system below ground. And so when we have decreased roots, the following year we'll see decreased biomass. So it's definitely a cycle of, if we have prolonged drought, if we're overgrazing, we'll see decreased roots, which means decreased biomass the next year. Definitely a cycle. 
here's a great picture to demonstrate that. So here's um, a root system where it has a lot of biomass on top. Right here, they took 50% of that biomass and you can definitely see the root system. It's starting to not be as thick. However, when we start to take 70 or 90% of the biomass on top, look at what happens to our root system. They definitely start to decrease and that can affect our range the following year. So if we look at this graph right here, um, percent root growth stopped. So when we start to take over 50% of the leaf removed above ground, that's when we really start to see the root system start to decrease. So that's typically, you know, when the, our Forest Service or BLM says, we really want you to only take 50% of the grasses, the biomass, that's typically where they're getting this from. Because when we start to take more than 50% of the biomass on top, that's when we really start to see a decrease in the root system. This is a really interesting study. This was done um, in the 1990s. And what they did is they looked at different pastures before drought, during drought, and after drought. So this graph up here is showing before drought in 1993. And let's see, this like dotted line right here is ungrazed pasture. They never grazed it. The dashed line right here, they only grazed it in 1994. And then the solid line, they grazed it in both 1994 and 1995. So what we saw in 1994, when there was a drought, this dashed, this dotted line, which is the pasture that they left ungrazed, you can definitely see that it kind of stayed the same. Whereas before the drought, all of the different treatments, they're about the same. The total production of the grasses was about the same. Um, in 1994, the pasture that they left ungrazed definitely held that production. And the pastures that they did graze, you can definitely see that decrease in production during the drought year. So the year following the drought, they saw that the pasture that they um, didn't graze all of the time um, kind of was about the same. Then the, the pasture that they rested started to catch back up. And then the pasture that they grazed again in 1995, you can definitely see the decrease in forage production between these two years. So two years after the drought, and they started um, grazing that pasture that they left untouched in 1995. And it definitely caught up with the pasture that was left ungrazed. However, the pasture that they grazed both in 1994 and 1995, look at the difference between this line and the two lines. You can see that they didn't let that pasture recover how it should have been recovered. So it's going to take longer for this pasture to recover than the pasture that they left ungrazed and left that, or the pasture that had a year to rest. So basically what this is saying is, we don't necessarily need to say, okay, we're in a drought, so we can't graze our pastures. Like we definitely need to utilize our pastures because that's our livelihood. But what this is saying is, what are we doing to help our range and our pastures recover after drought? What are we doing to make sure that the bounce back is faster rather than longer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you start to have prolonged drought, you're definitely gonna see a longer time for those pastures to bounce back rather than just a year of drought. But after the drought's over, what Dr. Thacker really wanted to drive home is what are you doing after drought to make sure your pastures are recovering faster so that you can get back to average levels. So before and during the drought, there's a few management practices that we can do. Moderate levels of use and growing season rest. So usually um, before and during the drought, we definitely can still utilize our pastures during the drought, but we definitely don't want to start going towards overgrazing. We wanna make sure we're being conservative with our pastures. Um, Pre-drought grazing sets the stage for recovery. So if we're overgrazing our pastures before drought, then drought hits and we're still overgrazing, what's gonna happen after drought? How long is it going to take for our pastures to recover? Um, and another thing, drought should not be an excuse to overuse rangelands. This is kind of a hard topic for some because 
like you said, like we have to still use our ranges, right? Like we, we have animals to feed, but at the same time, what's the cost when we start to overuse our rangelands? There's definitely a fine line right there. Um, declines in plant cover reduce the efficiency of precipitation. Now, this is really interesting. Dr. Thacker and I were talking about this. With drought, you kind of get a double whammy because not only with drought, you start to see decreased forage production, but when you have decreased forage production, you'll start to see decreased precipitation efficiency. So when we do get that precipitation, we don't have as much plants or biomass available to take in that precipitation. So it's almost like a double whammy. Really drought is not very fun for anybody involved. Now, this is what's really important and what Dr. Thacker really wanted to drive home is what we're doing after drought. So pre-drought conditions determine how well rangelands recover. So I, I feel like I've been repeating myself a lot, but how we treat our range before drought really determines how the drought will, or how our range will recover after drought. Um, restoration of plant vigor and cover may require a reduction in spring and summer stocking rates. So like I said, we need to give our pastures a little bit more time to recover. So if we decrease stocking rates or change what times we're grazing that pasture, we may see a bounce back in that pasture sooner rather than if we are grazing them all the time. And meaningful rest or deferment needed to enhance recovery of preferred species. So again, what times we're resting the pasture is able to help our pasture recover in such a way. Um, do you have any thoughts about this, Taylor, so far? Here in Mitch County, what happens with most of our drought is that there are producers who honestly just keep using their mm -hmm. pastures because of conditions and not because mm -hmm. of management for specific purposes. Mm -hmm. And those are where we see tons and tons of rabbit brush cover that comes in, especially hard. Mm -hmm. and once we take away all the perennial the good grasses, then our rabbit brush problems come along. I mean, rabbit brush doesn't go away in drought, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You can't kill it out. That'd be nice. But yeah. Anyway, we, uh, that's a, a common thing that we see on smaller allotments. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger allotments, we're kind of fortunate that we've been able to start developing lots of pastures west of town mm -hmm. that are finally able to incorporate rest. But some of our other allotments have also gotten uh, the ability to distribute grazing better so it's not concentrating around smaller areas mm -hmm. uh, they're finally able to distribute grazing a lot better and mm -hmm. so the utilization during the, the summer months are are less uh, anyway the the drought effects yeah i mean it, last year it, nobody was unaffected and, mm -hmm. and we all had a, a different way that we came out some of us some of the allotments in the in the county have had more ability to rotate between pastures, so that uh, utilization wasn't one of used so much. And other people had to come home uh, several months earlier than mm -hmm. the other ones with more pastures to rotate between. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of, of the management level that they're uh, able to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's an issue about as much land as you've got available, or or just what you want. Or what the water availability is, or or the, just feed resource. Mm -hmm. Taylor, I have a question for you uh -huh. on that regard. Based, based on your monitoring here in the county, like on her on the chart of plant degradation, and based upon what you've seen, if we were to start in back in a normal weather cycle, what do you think? How long do you think it would take our most of our ranges to fully heal and recover from where we put them already? I don't know about fully healed, but I think if you had two awesome banner years, two to three, we'd really start getting back to where we wish we could be at. The, the very first graphs at the beginning of the slides, I don't know if I quite agree with them. I, I think they're almost backwards. I would say we're more towards 75% of normal this year compared to last year. So I guess one thing that I was talking to Dr. Thacker about, because these are measured every 16 days, so I'm like, okay, maybe this was taken 16 days ago. Where were we 16 days ago in terms of weather? We were getting snow. I don't know how long ago, but it seems like last week. So it's really starting to warm up. So do you think that could bump it up a little bit? Well, I think coming out of the spring in the 2021 line, though, I, 
I wonder if it's still counting any sort of residual we have from the years before. Mm -hmm. That's what we ate a lot of last year. Mm -hmm. And cows spread out further just to make sure to find something to eat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, I think we're having better growth now. But the idea of timing of when the measurements are taken mm -hmm. could affect it. But I, I think we're doing better than half of the normal. Yeah, I mean, you, like I said, and I want to make sure everyone, this is measured from a satellite, whereas Taylor goes out on our ranges and sees it firsthand, right? So we definitely need to take this as a grain of salt. It's a great tool, but at the same time, we need to make sure we're actually talking to people who see it firsthand too. I, I read an interesting article the other day that was talking about rotational grazing, mm -hmm. whether you call it rest rotation rotation, whatever rotation you're doing. But the article, the author there was saying, hey, I think you need to have almost nine pastures, eight to nine to rotate the thing to be able to get an honest rest. If you have just a couple pastures, then you're just overusing a bunch of different pastures along the way instead of actually resting. Mm -hmm. I, I think having some sort of rotation is absolutely better than just a single mm -hmm. but, but having more pastures is is a better thing for talking about managing through a drought and mm -hmm. after a drought. Mm -hmm. So this quote was given by a range specialist in Arizona. And he said, the year following drought should be devoted as much as possible to improving plant vigor and restoring protective residual vegetation and plant litter. Pastures most likely to provide the largest increases in forage production should receive highest priority. Are there any thoughts about that? The longer you're able to do rest, who cares about utilization as much compared to you only have one or two pastures that utilization is really important. Mm -hmm. That's kind of your only tool. Mm -hmm. If you have lots of pastures that you can rest between, that's when it's utilization is not quite as big of a factor. Mm -hmm. um, this picture was taken in Southern Utah, so definitely different than Northern Utah. But really the point Dr. Thacker wanted to drive home is that if you look at the biomass on the ground, you can definitely see like this area is facing severe drought. Um, management practices might not be up to par. So you can see that there's a lot of bare ground. The grass looks not great. And if you look at this next picture, picture this is um, bunch grass of some kind. Sorry, I'm not. I don't know my plants, but this is some native grass. And you can see the head of this grass right here is pretty much dead besides that little piece and that little piece. And this was likely due to drought or possibly overgrazing. Um, what this is telling us is that the biomass that's above ground, what does the root system look like below, right? So if this pasture, if we came into it next year, and grazed it heavy, what's gonna to happen to this, to this pasture? What's gonna to happen to these grasses? They're likely just gonna die. Um, next, he wanted to talk about forage sustainability. And this is a really interesting study that was done. And this is again done in Southern Utah, maybe on an allotment where management practices are not great. They actually have some problems with bison and wild horses. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. This graph is looking at annual precipitation. You can see that there's a lot of ups and downs with the precipitation. However, this green line is the trend so that we can see that over 20 years, the precipitation has remained pretty much constant if we're looking at that trend. When we look at vegetation production, we can see lots of highs and lows, but because this allotment isn't managed very well, we can see a decrease in vegetation production. So I think Dr. Thacker said this is about a 15% reduction in vegetation production, which could in turn result in 15% decrease in AUMs or permits. So you ask yourself, if we're managing in such a way that we're decreasing the vegetation production by 15%, is it okay if we lose 15% of our permits at the end of the day, right? That's something that you have to look at. Is it okay if we lose permits based on how we're managing the range right now? Don't manage your range. You have to lose anyway. Exactly. 
right? I think it, we were talked about this before as ranchers were more like grass farmers and that goes with the range too. If we're not taking care of the range, at the end of the day, we're not bringing home a profitable product. The take home of this presentation is that pre drought grazing determines how quickly plants recover from post drought. So just make sure you're taking care of your range. Post drought grazing could have negative consequences if you're not taking care of your range in such a way that you're allowing for the plants to recover or the pasture to recover. Meaningful rest following drought ensures long term health of forage resources and utilization levels over 50% will compound root loss and damage the plant. Plant. Like I showed you in the, the pictures, if we start taking more than 50% on top, we definitely see a big decrease in the roots. So with that, I'll take any questions. If you have any questions for Taylor, that'd be great too about range and pasture management. It wasn't so much because of forage production, it was more because of water quality. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other legal things that were happening that, that they were challenging to determine. The biggest thing was water quality. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's an all be a free creek thing, but it's an interesting study that we're doing in this county to measure that in free creek. They measured the time that we're out of compliance with the Utah standard with the grazing systems that we do. And there's a rest from state underneath the threshold legally in the state. And three creeks can't with the with the past grazing systems. Desert always could. Now we're mimicking desert and that's just another thing with grazing management. Sure. Anyway, it's just kind of cool thing with all the things grazing management does. But mm -hmm. if there's one maybe little thing real quick is mm -hmm. whenever someone says something about overgrazing, a definition of overgrazing is number of times the grass is fit during the drought season. Mm -hmm. Utilization is when it's short. So if you only ever see short grass, it doesn't only mean it's over overgrazed. It's just mm -hmm. number of green grass. So sometimes I always try to, that's like an interesting thing that grazing can think of is just remember that overgrazing is only about number of bites taken and not no. short grass. Well, that's great. That's why you're here, Taylor, right? <laughs> no, I, all of us can help make sure we get the right definitions. Of it. <laughs> I think it's interesting because the follow-up to what I was asking you earlier. Mm -hmm. If we work with these, I mean, I realize I keep talking about these stocking, it's the hardest thing to do because it costs you money. But um, if, if everybody could work, if you were to look at your range and it was in poor condition, if you would cut like 20% of your cows, how much faster, you know, and it's going to vary from place to place, but how much faster can you recover and make the land healthier? Long run, if you can make your land healthier a year or two earlier, you're going to make more money than if you're that many more cows for that year. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I just want to say how excited I am to fix this the rotation cover and the best of the comments. And I asked my dad, how many years, when, how many years ago did you? We started talking about it in 2007 and we started really getting after it in 2009. Well, you know, since then, I just think our I'm, I'm just like, well, whether it's three creeks, I mean, Billy's got the rain down mm -hmm. east that they do a rotation with, and Dio's got six patches, you know, cut off. I mean, we're we're doing a lot of grazing changes. Mm -hmm. It's not just three creeks in the county. And we've been able to do a lot of good things for everybody, no matter where we're at. So we're long, we're just progressing, no matter what stage. So I guess I have a question for you, Taylor. What do you do for producers when, I mean, public and private are two different things. With public, you kind of, you don't really have a lot of say on how the agencies want you to manage that land. So how can you be proactive using public land as far as grazing management? Does that make sense? Agree or disagree with me, this row here, guy, but I think public lands, I think traditionally we just keep used to being told what we have to do and that's just all there is to it. 
do as you have to do. And sometimes bringing out ideas, you get so stinking frustrated from ever trying to ask for anything and everything. That's hard. Mm -hmm. Our county has become an example of someone where we went locally first and then out to the agencies. But we did a broad scale and, and it was nice to have political help behind you. But like the state of Utah and others to be able to make big changes such as three foods. That was kind of a locally led back up to the agencies. Mm -hmm. and, and we use different laws that are supposed to be there and use more that are never used anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, going through local governments like the counties mm -hmm. and states to go up to the regulations. That answered my question, yeah. Me, totally. This is me. <laughs> totally. It's hard. It's hard for me because it's kind of a, a one size fits all deal, kind of. And so on years you you want to do things a little different and maybe try and conserve a little or do, do different things, but scary to me because you think well if I, if I put less cows on this year because I want to save some grass or whatever then BLM's going to come back and say well it looks so good with less cows we're going to cut your numbers every year and that's a scary situation mm -hmm. you know? I, I hate that one size fits all thing. I, I know they're trying their best but that, that that's the scary part of it share more stories. I, I work with people who lie on their actual use and they make sure to put every last number that they can in case they ever get cut. So if they do get cut, they go down to the same number they're actually really using. That's not <laughs> just a strategy. Uh, I hate to say it, but that's definitely play the game. Yes. And that's not yeah. how agencies should be managed. But they, you feel like they got real prepared kind of it. It's, it's hard to, to be a little bit creative because you're, you're afraid of what they're going to come back to do to you. Almost. That's my take on public. I wish they had I wish they had it set up to where instead of punishing all the time, you're going to start with all the cat reward system. Yeah, that's the way it should be. <laughs> I don't think numbers will ever go up. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever seen them go up? Actually, yeah. have some. It's rare, yeah. but we have seen some. And actually, I have a lot of deal in for that. It's in Solid. Good one to do your energy function activity as a future. What their thoughts are. Is there some that are pro raising? Is there some that are pro? Are there any other questions? No, okay. Thank you all for coming. And I just wanna thank our specialists again for taking the drive to come up and talking to you guys. Oh, sure. So if you haven't, I know there's been a survey going around. Um, if you haven't taken the survey, if you have like a quick three minutes, that's probably all it takes to take fill out the survey. If you do that, that'd be great. Um, we also have a sign up sheet. We have to report numbers. So if you wanna sign your name really quick. And then we have fact sheets and these BQA field guides for everyone to pick up if you want. So thank you again for all coming out. And if you have any questions for our specialists, I'm sure they'd be willing to answer any more. No? They're not willing. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs>